I want to leave the maps and tell you some stories. That's better. <laughs> we'll start in this direction. Well, stay here. <laughs> well, if you are looking to the east, to this direction, in a normal day, you can see the mountains. It's not easy to see them. Maybe you can see them between the clouds. Uh, the mountains of Jordan Kingdom and the, in the valley, in a normal day, we can see the Dead Sea. Today there is some haze there, I don't know what it is, or fog. Uh, the white mountains that you can see, this is Judea Desert. And you can see that in the desert, you can see uh, there is an Israeli settlement there with uh, red roof houses and uh, trees there. This is a settlement called Kedar. About 100 Israeli families li live there. They are in the Palestinian side of the fence because there is no way to connect them to the Israeli side uh, and do it without making uh, troubles to the Palestinians. Here you can see the walls in East Jerusalem. The fence is coming from the valley to the mountain. And in the, on the mountain you can see the tower there that when it comes to urban area, it changed from a wire fence to a concrete wall. So you can see the concrete walls there on the mountain getting to the valley, climb the mountain again, and you can see behind the wall there, you can see there are some trees there, and there is a blue uh, cape in one side, and in the other side you can see a yellow dome. Or a, this is the campus of El Quds University. Well, El Quds is the Arabic name of Jerusalem. So why? leaving the Arabic University of Jerusalem out of the fence. Well, this university is built outside the municipal area of Jerusalem, but it's not a good reason. The second thing is that this university gets most of the money from Saudi Arabia. They teach here physics and chemistry, and you know what they are using it, making bombs. Uh, but that's not a good reason. Uh, the president of this university is a very tolerant man. His name is Seri Nuseba, probably you heard this name. He's a very nice man. And when I came to this area, I met with Seri Nuseba and I asked him where the students and the professors are coming from. And he said to me, most of them are coming from the West Bank. So I prefer that they will have free access to the university from their side. And if students and professors are coming from the a Israeli side from East Jerusalem to the university, I constructed a special gate for them that they can go to the university, but in the way back they have to cross a security check. When we start constructing the walls there, we got a telephone call from Condoleezza Rice, and she said, you cannot build it. I said, why? I was three times in the White House. I showed them all the plans, all the maps. What's the problem? And she said, you are entering the campus area. No army is entering campus area. I said, of course, I'm out from the university. But she insists. I went to Seri Nuseba. He said, you are out from the university. But she insists. I took picture, pictures. I sent them to the White House. And she insists. We ask, how come? And she said, you are entering the soccer field of the university. I don't know any soccer field there. I went to Seri Nuseba. I asked him, where is the soccer field? And he said, well, we don't have one. We hope that someday we'll have one. Maybe she means that agricultural land where the students are playing. So I changed the route of the fence there. I include that agricultural uh, land in the Palestinian side, and I completed the wall near the university. From there, you can see that the wall is getting to the valley, climbing the mountain again, and then you can see a square of white houses in the Israeli side of the, of the wall there. You can see these houses here. This is the story of Shakirat family. Shakirat family is a Palestinian family from the West Bank. They have Palestinian IDs. And before the fence was built, they built their houses illegally inside the municipal area of Jerusalem. When I came with the wall, I didn't know what to do with them. If I leave them in the Israeli side, they will be isolated from the West Bank. If I leave them in the Palestinian side, uh, uh, we will be in a very bad operational position. So I didn't know what to do with them. I went uh, to the Minister, uh, the Ministry of uh, um, Interior uh, uh, in, uh, in Israel and I asked them, 
can you give those 120 people Israeli IDs? That's all. They said to me, no, they are illegal. Remove them. I said, <laughs> we are not going to destroy or evacuate even one Palestinian house by building the fence. So I had to construct a special gate. This gate is open 24, is meant 24 hours a day, seven days a week, only for these 120 people that build their houses illegally in the Israeli side, that they can send their children to the Palestinian side, they can go to uh, work there, they can visit their families there, and whatever they want, but in the way back they have to cross a security check. From there you can see that the, the wall is... Ah, yeah. Um, how do you check that only... Well, is it like a FG74 with a chip card or is it... A, is there is a small checkpoint, uh, it's only for one family, so... But how do you check that only they cross? No they know else. the people, they okay. uh, the oh, soldiers okay. there, they have uh, IDs, they, they know the, num the number of the ID, it's no, no problem. <clears throat> From there the wall climbs the mountain, get to the valley, climbs the mountain again, and then you can see that it's vanished between the houses there. This is the story of El Azaria village. El Azaria is a Palestinian village uh, outside of the uh, municipal area of Jerusalem. The municipal area of Jerusalem climbs uh, along the forest there. You can see this, there is a road that climbs the mountain near the forest there. And the forest and the town is in the Palestinian side. Uh, so I thought that the best line will be along this road, but in this, uh, in this town, there is a Christian holy site, Lazarus tomb, or Bethany. There are thousands of pilgrims that are coming every year to this place, and there are 17 monasteries from all kinds in this small forest there. And when I came there and I designed the line, leaving them in the Palestinian side, the priests and the nuns came to me and they said to me, please, don't let us stay in the Palestinian side. We don't want that what happened to the Christians in Bethlehem will happen to us here. Please let us stay in the Israeli side. So I said, okay. And I tried to design a line between the houses and the forest there. You can see that it's very, very complicated to do it, but I start doing it. And then the Anglican bishop came to me and he said to me, well, we have your so small land. Go to the Franciscans. I went to the Franciscans, they said to me, well, we have your so anxious olive trees, go to the Lutherans. I went to the Lutherans, they sent me to the Greeks, I went to the Greeks, they sent me to the Russians, and I couldn't get out from it. So I said to them, sit together, find a line, and I'll build it. They said to me, no, we're not talking to each other. <laughs> so I called the ambassador of the Vatican in Jerusalem. It's not a normal thing that one man is honored by all churches, but he was. His name was Pietro Sambi. He was the nuncio of the Pope in Jerusalem, and later he was possessed in Washington, D.C. He just passed over in the last year. Really very uh, honored man. And they said to Pietro Sambi, please help me to help your people. And he said to me, no, we are coming with good faith to everyone. I won't help you building walls in Jerusalem. So I said to him, if you are not helping me, I'll leave them all in the Palestinian side. So he said to me, I'll just help you to garden them all. So we hold a meeting in Inbal Hotel in Jerusalem. Everyone came with his traditional uniform. I came with my army uniform, of course. Uh, I talked there for two hours. I showed them the maps. I showed them the plans. How I minimized the damage here. How I minimized the damage there. And in the end, I understood that no one understood me. And it's not only because of my lousy English. It's because these people are religious people. They don't know to read maps. They don't know to read pl uh, plans. They were so excited to meet each other. They were so excited to meet the army. And I want them to take decisions. So I had to flew to the Vatican. And they met with the deputy of Secretary of State of the Vatican. He was prepared for this meeting. He has his own maps, his own plans. We were talking there for hours, and in the end he said to me, well, you are a Jew, you cannot understand it. I said, why? I know every priest here by his name. What's the problem? And he said to me, well, these people are sent here in a mission. Their mission is to convert Muslims, not to convert Christians. They have to have free access to the Muslim side. I said, no problem. So I will leave them in the Palestinian <laughs> side. He said to me, no, 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 no. <laughs> He signed on my maps, and I came back, and I built it on the ground. 
It took two years to have the decision and seven months to build it on the ground. Today, all the monasteries are in the Israeli side, but the tomb itself stayed in the Palestinian side. So I had to construct there a special gate, Lazarus Gate. This gate is normally closed, but there is the telephone number of the border police there that if pilgrims or priests are coming and they need to cross, they are calling the border police, they let them go to the Palestinian side, but in the way back they have to cross a security check. And this is only 700 meters of this fence of 726 kilometers long. Uh, if you have questions, okay, let's go.